Space exploration has been the dream of science fiction authors and enthusiasts since, well, before we even had the technology to go into space. Today, we do. We actually have people living full time in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station. We have put men on the moon and we have companies that are said to be commercializing space. But all of this begs the question, what will space and the universe beyond mean for humanity into the future? Well, of course, I am not a physicist or an astronaut or an astronomer. I am an economist. But curiously enough, economic viability may have more to do with space than anything else. If there is one way to ensure that something gets done, it's to present some kind of economic reward to the victorious participants. In the same way, the promise of spices worth their weight in gold compelled our forefathers across the ocean in rinky wooden ships, and in the same way, a salary encourages you to get up and go to work on any given day. Now, there is no limit of the treasures amongst the stars. From asteroids of platinum and gold to exotic forms of helium, and even the potential of a second civilization. The promise of riches unfathomable to our terrestrial species may be the impetus that drives men into the stars, or more specifically, it may be the only thing that does it. You see, space travel is expensive. Probably the single most expensive endeavor accessible to man at this time. So expensive that global billionaires aren't using mansions and super yachts to flex on each other anymore, they are using space programs. It always seems like the limitation on human space exploration is financial, to the point that people have proposed that the only thing standing between us and making Star Trek a reality is redirecting military funding exclusively towards NASA or some other such nonsense. Which begs the question, what would it take to make all of this cool space stuff economically viable? Well, the first place that most people look for this is governments. And certainly, it seems in the immediate future, they share the most promise. To date, the governments of the world, or more specifically, these governments, are the only institutions that have put people into space for any sustained period of time. And this kind of makes sense. As we have seen, spaceflight is expensive, and governments around the world represent the largest concentrations of wealth in history. Another factor is that so far, space travel hasn't necessarily been a profitable industry. Things like the moon landing and the International Space Station are very, very impressive feats of human ingenuity, but it's very difficult to see any kind of return on investment from these ventures. Now, governments are not profit-driven, but they still do need to maintain some kind of control over their spending. Despite what many critics may say, a lot of thought does actually go into most national budgets, and the incentive is not necessarily to make a lot of profit, but rather to increase the overall wealth of the nation. Spending on infrastructure accommodates more business to be conducted more efficiently, public parks increase the value of life of residents, emergency services and welfare ensure that people can maintain safe living standards, and even more abstract spending like military services have their perks. Military spending itself is a perverse type of welfare. It often accommodates education, training, and stable employment to millions of individuals who would not otherwise be able to access these services. Beyond this, of course, national defense is still very important in defending the interests of the country, domestic and abroad, to make sure all of these public services that we luxuriate in are not taken away from us. All of these services don't really have a return on investment per se, but they fulfill the role of public goods. Delivering public goods is really the role of governments in basic economic theory. Things like public schools, public defense, and even things like bridges and streetlights add value to a society, but they are non-excludable and non-rivalrous. What this means is that a government might pay $2,000 to set up a streetlight, and that streetlight illuminates a road and sidewalk to make traffic safer and walking at night easier. But that light is very, very hard to commercialize. There is no way to exclude someone from enjoying the light that this street lamp casts, meaning it is non-excludable, and it is not possible for someone to hog all of this light, meaning it is non-rivalrous. On a larger scale, the same thing is true for things like public defense. Just because the military protects you from foreign powers doesn't mean that they also protect your neighbors at the same time. All of this is great because it means that resources can be spread out over an entire civilization, 
but it is terrible if you are a business. If you are selling something, you want to make sure that only the people that pay you get access to whatever it is that you're selling. Now sure, there are some crossovers. Toll roads exist in contrast to public roads because companies can exclude people from using them with boom gates. But in our streetlight example, there is no real way for a company to stop someone using a streetlight if they don't pay for it. And so nobody actually would pay for it unless they were absolutely forced to through things like taxes. What this all has to do with space travel though is that institutions like NASA effectively follow the same rules as public spending. NASA is there to provide a public service that would not have otherwise been funded by private enterprise. The public benefits that the International Space Station provides are a little bit less tangible than that of a streetlight, but they are there. Technological breakthroughs have been made that have trickled down to commercial aviation and all disciplines of science. We also have things like GPS and world maps, and we take all of this for granted today. But again, all of this has been made possible by public expenditure on space travel. But all of this is still non-excludable. And on top of this, NASA's funding and the funding of other national space organizations does actually seem pretty reasonable. You see, a government can only raise so much money from taxes without squashing its own economies or forcing people to move abroad to avoid paying those taxes altogether. So it does still have a limited budget. And things like roads and welfare and a military keep a lot more people happy, prosperous, and most importantly employed than advanced spaceflight does. So the money spent on this is more or less proportional to the amount of good it brings a society. The actual public good that an institution like NASA delivers to an economy is actually the research and development it can pass down to institutions that again would not have otherwise conducted this research and development themselves. This extends to things like materials research and satellite based communications technologies and even setting up the infrastructure to facilitate the US military in its development of GPS which has in turn been passed to all members of society, both inside and outside of the United States. A severe limitation on NASA as an agency is that it actually isn't there to do really cool stuff like land on the moon or Mars or recreate the Millennium Falcon. It is basically a government run science agency, not too dissimilar from the National Science Foundation or DARPA or even the Center for Disease Control. It is there to do research that wouldn't otherwise be publicly funded and then pass those findings along to private enterprise, which it has done very, very well. Even besides the examples of things like GPS that we probably use every day to guide container ships or navigate our cars or play Pokemon Go, we have seen this trickle down of technology accommodate the development of companies like the United Launch Alliance and more relevantly, SpaceX. Elon Musk and SpaceX have delivered some amazing technology, which is pushing the development of cheaper, more accessible spaceflight for regular institutions, and also promising to deliver technologies like Starlink, which in turn promises to deliver low latency, high speed internet all over the world. A lot of the development of this company is internal, and the achievements that this business has realized cannot be understated, but they did have a lot of research handed down to them by NASA which is exactly its function. In return for a few billion dollars a year in funding, the US government now has a domestic space company that is promising cheaper access to space, employing thousands of highly trained engineers, developing their own technologies, and most importantly, promising to potentially raise billions of dollars in tax revenue into the future, which actually all starts to make NASA look like a pretty good not investment after all. But government budgets are not why we are here. As important as understanding discretionary fiscal spending is, and as much as I try to sneak a lesson like this into every video I make, you all want to know what it would take to make Star Trek a reality that is financially viable. There are a few ways you can improve the output of an economy, but ultimately it breaks down to increasing your pool of labor, increasing your technology, and or increasing your pool of resources. Over the last century, the world has gone through an unprecedented period of rapid economic growth because all of these things have improved. 
innovation and technology has made things like more efficient farming, production and resource extraction possible, which means that we can support more people, which means that we have more workers and more innovators to improve technology, which helps support more people and the extraction of more resources. It's kind of a self-fulfilling cycle, but it's not indefinite. We live on a relatively small rock with effectively limited natural resources. The majority of our industrial development has been fueled with non-renewable and very, very polluting fossil fuels that have been a really great and easy way to access energy, but do have a theoretical limit, whether that be through simply running out or causing some kind of climate crisis. Either way, if we want to continue the logical progression of our species, we are going to have to harvest more resources and more energy than our little blue ball can reasonably accommodate. We have explored the idea of the Kardashev scale before when we looked at the economy of the Star Wars galaxy. Now that particular fictional universe was obviously far more advanced than our own, and we were able to identify that by showing that the energy consumption of this hypothetical civilization was many, billions of times that of our own. So it seems that the next logical step seems to be to start to access these resources. Now as with any commercial undertaking, we must do a potential cost-benefit analysis. The cost of space-based industry is astronomical, literally. The International Space Station is said to have cost over $150 billion, and it really only accommodates scientific research not heavy industry. The logical end goal for our society would be to build a Dyson Swarm to harvest all of the energy of our sun, but that is such a distant reality I may as well be making speculations about the galaxy far, far away. In a more realistic time frame, a lot of people have pointed out the fact that there are literally asteroids floating around in space that are made of platinum or gold. In fact, there are probably asteroids in our solar system that have more gold in them than Earth's entire supply. So, you beauty, a market value of an asteroid like that would be worth trillions. And yeah, well, sure. But even if we did have the technology to access those resources, which to be honest, we probably do if push came to shove, there is no way that the benefits, however great they are, would be substantial enough to offset the costs. The fixed costs of R&D to develop a system capable of reaching and navigating around an asteroid and harvesting its resources and then delivering those resources to home would easily eclipse the budgets of programs like the Apollo moon landings and the International Space Station. And then even the ongoing costs of fuel and maintenance, guidance and wastage or single use rocket parts would mean that the whole thing is just not profitable. These materials are simply too heavy and not valuable enough and solid gold not being valuable enough should give you an idea of the price of these kinds of ventures. So we need something many, many times more valuable than gold, which leads us on to another promising resource, and that is helium-3. Nuclear fusion has the potential to be a limitless source of power to replace all of those pesky fossil fuels that we were talking about earlier, but the technology is not quite there yet, and the fuel it requires Helium-3 is actually super rare on Earth. The good news is that it is relatively abundant on the Moon. Now the Moon is a lot closer than the asteroid belt, it's probably a lot easier to work with, and the price per gram of Helium-3 is thousands of times that of even solid gold, which means that the cost-benefit analysis does shift more in favor of actually making this viable. The issue is though, the technology is not quite there yet. The other big thing that could impact this whole industry is good old supply and demand. Let's say it takes 10 years for nuclear fusion to become a viable technology. Once that happens, the race will be on to find the cheapest source of fuel to power these reactors around the world. Now, at the moment, that may genuinely be going to the moon. But terrestrial developments in nuclear technology could produce this fuel on Earth cheaper than getting it off the moon. Which means as cool as it would be, no rational profit-seeking business is going to go to the moon. So this all starts to sound pretty disheartening. The kind of institutions that can afford the cost of space are purely profit-seeking enterprises that will try to avoid the expenses of space at all costs. 
or they are government agencies that aren't really there to do the cool stuff anyway. But that's just it. This kind of relationship will just need to continue. A lot of people get disheartened about space enterprises not receiving enough funding to recreate the enterprise because it would be awesome. But those people are missing how these limited budgets are actually making real space industries viable. Sure, the moon program went a long way to stick it to the commies, but after that, the space shuttle program developed technologies that are taken for granted around the world today, but this whole process is actually very similar to a standard product life cycle. You know those people that line up in front of the Apple store for weeks on end to be the first person to purchase the new iPhone? Or the people that pay thousands of dollars for a resale supreme brick or whatever? Well, these are what we call early adopters. The product life cycle details how different groups of people interact with products throughout its sales run. And while this is technically a marketing process, it does have to do a lot with the economics of space. You see, government agencies are these relatively new adopters. They probably massively overpay for these kinds of services because they want to be first. But what this allows is more regular and cost conscious consumers to come in after them and buy up these products with confidence, knowing that they might be getting a slightly cheaper deal, if nothing else, and that the products actually work. Derek from Public Relations tries out the new iPhone 15X and tells you it's pretty great. The battery life is good and he's getting a lot of use out of the fisheye 3D selfie cam. So you decide, eh, maybe I will pick one up when my phone plan runs out. In the same way, NASA plays around with the whole idea of reusable space vehicles like the Space Shuttle and SpaceX decides, hey yeah, that looks alright. Thanks for trying that out for us, we will do that too with our Falcon rocket. Now this is of course a huge oversimplification of the relationship between these agencies and companies, but in their incredibly intricate product development schedule, some of these basic principles hold true. And the good news is that it means that these kinds of organizations get all the funding that they really need. Space these days does not have an issue with people not investing enough money into it. If tomorrow a company attempted to raise a trillion dollars to fund an expedition that would provide tangible returns of two trillion dollars reliably, that venture would be funded overnight. The thing is that the technology part of this equation is not quite there yet, but that's okay. Government agencies will continue to develop this research and pass along the lessons of what works and what does not to institutions that are happy to be a little bit more on the cutting edge of the product life cycle. It may not be a moon base, but this progress will mean that more and more endeavors will be workable. Things like satellite TV these days, Starlink in the coming years, and hopefully following that some more exciting developments into the future will all be made possible because governments or the cost of initial technological development. I am a huge science fiction fan, and I love the idea of saying, screw it, let's build the Millennium Falcon in low Earth orbit. But it won't happen until it becomes economically viable. Fortunately though, it will happen almost immediately after it does. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider liking and subscribing if you did. As always, a huge thank you to our new patrons over on Patreon. Your support continues to make all of these videos possible. We will be hosting a Q&A session live streamed on the second channel, linked in the video description after this video goes up. If you want to be involved in that, come on over there to participate, or you can join our Discord server directly to ask me questions on the spot. Otherwise guys, have a good one. Thanks. Bye.